All right, welcome everyone. So today we're gonna to be talking about regulatory genomics, about gene regulation, chromatin accessibility, and the DNA regulatory code. So uh, today is the first of our string of uh, guest speakers. So uh, we're gonna to try to, at every lecture, give a introduction to the field and actually invite two authors of influential papers in the field so that you get to both hear from them directly and also get to meet people from uh, who are practitioners from different institutions and different labs and different backgrounds to give you the opportunity to um, you know either reach out in your final project or collaborate with them or find internships uh, and so on so forth. So today we're fortunate to have Anshul Kondachi, who's a professor at Stanford and who's done a lot of uh, work on deep learning for regulatory genomics across many years, and also Avanti Kalal from Nvidia who actually uh, just published a very cool paper uh, on Tuesday <laughs> for deep learning for both attack and single cell attack. So I love having both the sort of old timers and the sort of here's the latest and greatest that has happened uh, in the field. But what we're gonna look at today is the first module of many. So uh, if you look at our uh, lecture schedule, so here we are, we basically have uh, just finished having the first few intro lectures on just machine learning foundations, convolution neural networks, recurrent neural networks and graph neural networks, interpretability, generative models, adversarial models, variational to encoders. And uh, you know, this is the end of module one, the uh, ML models and interpretation. We're now entering module two on gene regulation so we're gonna have lectures on DNA accessibility, promoters and enhancers, transcription factors, DNA methylation, gene expression and splicing. And for each of those, I will be introducing the foundations and then we will have guest speakers, uh, some of whom you can see have already confirmed. And uh, then we're gonna talk about single cell RNA sequencing and then switch to module three on genetic variation, module four on graphs and proteins, and then module five on imaging which we have in many ways already touched upon, but not in the context of medical uh, information. So here we are basically entering the DNA accessibility module. <clears throat> and uh, what, I'm, what I'm gonna talk about today is the biological foundations. What are the building blocks of gene regulation? And then what are some classical methods for regulatory genomics and motif discovery? And then how do we apply convolutional neural networks uh, on regulatory genomics and uh, uh, motif discovery. And, uh, you know, just point you to some of the earliest papers. We're actually going to have um, the, uh, you know, several of the authors of these papers uh, speak at our class, which is uh, very cool. All right, so let's dive right in. What are the building blocks of uh, gene regulation? So, um, first of all, gene regulation, I think, is one of the most fascinating uh, areas of science, period. The fact that as a computer scientist, basically realizing that you could write an automaton, you could write a program that is self-contained. It's all written in assembly code. We have 3 billion letters of assembly code, A, C, G, T. And you construct such a program <laughs> so that having just the code, just the DNA of that program allows you to make all of the complexity of all of the structures in an entire robotic organism, which is self-healing, <laughs> which is uh, developing from a single copy of that program by a series of cell divisions, and which basically constructs the entire plan of not only where will the head be and where will the toes be, but also the intricacy of interconnections across every single aspect of your body. If you look at your skin, there's you know, so many different types of cells that are just intricately interweaved with each other. And there's blood circulation, there's neuronal uh, innervation. If you look at your heart, you basically have cells that are pumped through the blood, white blood cells that carry the same DNA as you know, your cells that are pumping it, the muscle cells that are pumping it, as the neuronal cells that are sort of triggering these muscles to you know, beat in a regular pattern. The same exact code runs inside your neurons that are sending that signal, that are influenced by all of the stimuli that you receive and so on and so forth. So it's an amazing feat of evolutionary engineering to basically have arrived at this unbelievable complexity from a single genetic code. 
And what makes that complexity possible is that every single cell in your body remembers the state that it's in, remembers its identity, despite having no other context uh, information. Basically, if you take that cell early on and you place it in another context, it will receive different stimuli that will then lead to a different, um, you know, a different identity for that cell. So how is this all uh, possible is the question. And the, the way that it's possible is through the regulatory circuitry of your cells. And what that regulatory circuitry is based on is a set of primitives, a set of um, words that we're gonna be using deep learning to recognize and a set of constructs that allow you to remember those words and, um, and remember the state of every single piece of uh, the genome. So this is made possible through the packaging of your DNA in not just structural, but also functional constructs that serve both to compact the DNA, every single one of your cells has two meters worth of DNA and you have trillions of cells. If you were to put together all of your cells and all of the DNA from every one of your cells, it wouldn't just reach from Boston to New York. It wouldn't just reach from Boston to the Himalayas. It wouldn't just reach from Boston to the moon. It would reach from Boston to Jupiter 10 times. And that's for every single person on this Zoom line. <laughs> so it's, it's an immense uh, feat of compacting that we can feed so much DNA inside every one of our cells. But the way that it is compacted is actually extremely information carrying. The way that it happens is that every 147 base pairs of DNA is looped around each nucleosome. And you have basically two loops around with roughly 150 base pairs and roughly a 50 base pair linker. So you can think of DNA as having 200 base pair chunks, units of packaging, which are decorated with different histone modifications. And these histone modifications are post-translational modifications that happen on the tails of histone proteins that DNA is wrapped around. So let's introduce some vocabulary. A nucleosome is one of these little balls, one of these little beads in a string kind of view of DNA. And this has actually been visualized with microscopes for decades now, where we could see these beads of an, on a string. And this was, the, every one of these beads was a nucleosome. Now, every nucleosome is made out of four histone proteins, each in two copies, H2A in two copies, H2B in two copies, H3 in two copies, and H4 in two copies. And that's the standard view. And there's many different variants of these nucleosomes where you can replace some of those proteins with close analogs. And DNA is basically wrapped around those. And every one of those histone proteins has a long amino acid tail sticking out, which can be modified post-translationally. What does that mean? That means that at histone H3, which is the red one here, or histone H2A or H2B that are the blue ones here, or H4, which is the green one here, you can have a modification, for example, that lysine, which is written as K, position four, the fourth amino acid, which is a lysine, I can have three methyl groups, which are basically adding methylation, 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 or one methyl group, or one acetyl group, and so on and so forth, okay? Who's with me on sort of the nomenclature here and all of the sort of intricacies of nucleosomes, histone proteins, and then histone tails, which can be post-translationally modified by adding acetylation groups or methylation groups and so on and so forth. Uh, awesome. So <clears throat> 64, 23, 14, 00. zero. Um, so um, these effectively work in combination with two additional epigenomic marks. One of them is directly on the DNA. So CPG dinucleotides, a C followed by a G in the five prime to three prime direction, which is also a C followed by a G in the opposite strand, again, in the five prime to three prime direction, 
So CPG dinucleotides, C phosphate G, can be modified with DNA methylation. So you can actually uh, change the quote unquote meaning of letters of DNA by changing a C into a methyl C. So transcription factors that normally bind a C will no longer to be able to bind when they see a methyl C, okay? So that's one type of additional modification. And then the other type is, is the DNA accessible for binding? So different transcription factors, which are proteins that bind DNA and modulate the level of transcription. That's why they call them transcription factors because they mu multiply the amount of transcription by a particular factor. So these transcription factors can basically access DNA more easily when DNA is accessible, namely in between nucleosomes. And you can think of gene regulation as a struggle between nucleosomes wanting to occupy that DNA and transcription factors pushing the nucleosomes away and then getting you know, pushed back by the nucleosome. So the three types of modifications are number one, DNA accessibility that tells you what regions are accessible. Number two, histone modifications that tell you how to interpret these 200 base pair chunks. And number three, DNA methylation, which sometimes changes the binding of transcription factors or proteins that bind DNA that some of them prefer the methyl C form, others prefer the unmethylated C. All right, so I've introduced a lot of nomenclature who's comfortable about the three types of modifications, DNA accessibility, histone modifications, and DNA methylation. <clears throat> awesome. Very nice. So 70, 20, 10, 0, 0. Um, cool. So now we can use this combination of the three types of modifications to talk about different classes of elements using this language of epigenomics. We're going to be able to remember the programming of every cell type in the body by uh, tuning the compacting of the DNA to specific signatures of promoter regions. And promoter regions are the places where RNA polymerase will basically bind and then transcribe a gene, copy a gene from DNA into RNA inside the nucleus to then export it for translation and for utilization of that gene. So the, the, the promoter is basically the most basic class of regulatory element. So that's where most of the action happens proximal to the gene for transcription to actually start. And promoters are marked by H3K4 trimethylation, H3K9 acetylation, DNA accessibility, and so on and so forth. Now transcribe regions are marked by a different set of marks. H3K36 trimethyl, K79 trimethyl, and H4K20 monomethyl. Repressed regions are marked by one of three different signatures, either DNA methylation, which is a form of repression. Most regulatory regions, when they're methylated, are repressed. H3K27 trimethylation, this is polycomb repression. You can think of it as facultative repression. It's basically shuts off and shuts on much more rapidly. And then there's heterochromatin, which is this stable repression of large regions of the genome, which is marked by H3K9 trimethylation. Okay, so we talked about promoters, transcribe regions, repress regions. And the, perhaps the coolest of all uh, regions and the most interesting by far are enhancer regions. So unlike promoter regions that are right next to where transcription starts, enhancers can be very distal, sometimes a million nucleotides away from their target, sometimes in the middle of introns and then looping back and you know, contacting these promoters. And these enhancers are extremely dynamic across cell types. Promoters are extremely stable, enhancers are extremely dynamic. And enhancers are marked by H3K4 monomethylation instead of trimethylation, H3K27 acetylation instead of K9 acetylation and DNA accessibility, just like promoters, but to a lower degree. All right, <laughs> so much new uh, biology, but who's with me so far on all the different classes of promoters, enhancers, repressed regions, transcribed regions, and all of the combinations of marks 
that are uh, labeling them as such. Lovely. So we're at 60, 22, 9, 17, 00. Okay. So we in our group have developed methods for systematically annotating and even discovering these states of the chromatin. And we call them very creatively chromatin states. So why do we call them chromatin states? Because they are the different states of the chromatin, but also because we used a hidden Markov model whose hidden states would basically correspond to enhancers, promoters, transcribe, repress regions, et cetera, learned and trained completely de novo across the entire genome to be able to discover combinations of these histone modification marks and other marks that occurred in a non-random fashion, not necessarily more abundantly, but more non-randomly, because many of these states were found to encompass a very, very small part of the genome, whereas other states like repressed states and heterochromatic states cover huge, huge swaths of the genome. Promoter states and enhancer states cover only 1% or less of the genome, and yet they're very distinctly discovered. So we can use this multivariate hidden Markov model to discover these chromatin states, and we can use that to then study where are enhancer regions and promoter regions and transcribe regions in every different cell type of the body. And now the most interesting part is how is this all encoded by the genome? How is this all encoded by the DNA? So it's happening through sequence specific proteins that recognize the patterns of DNA sequence in different locations of the genome. So transcription factors use these DNA binding domains to recognize specific DNA sequences in the genome and those sequences are, for example, TATA or CAC-GTG, which is a palindrome. If you read it on the opposite trend, it's again CAC-GTG and so on and so forth. And the uh, spe specific structures of these proteins dictate their binding. For example, CAC-GTG, because it's a reverse palindrome, it's usually because two components of a protein that are identical to each other are binding in the same location. And of course, mutations in the DNA, which we're going to talk about in the next module, are hugely um, enriched for non-coding regions rather than protein coding regions of the genome. And the current model is that they perturb binding sites for these proteins and then cause loss of their binding, eventually leading to disease. So who's with me so far on these regulatory motifs and how the proteins recognize DNA in the first place. <clears throat> okay, lovely. So 60, 25, 10, 5, 0. So that's how the proteins recognize DNA. And every single protein has a slightly different structure. And they don't recognize DNA by complementarity, like RNA and DNA recognize each other. They recognize their binding motifs through feeling of the bases in the closed DNA. And basically an A will have a particular atom here that maybe a G would also have. And that would cause that motif to, to like either an A or a G at that position. And then here, only the T has the right set of atoms that are sticking out at that location, enabling that protein to recognize it and so on and so forth. And the way that we represent these DNA motifs is by piling on all of the binding sites, for example, for this ABF1 regulator, and then recognizing that, wow, they seem to have the same DNA sequence. So you can create a position weight matrix that allow you to recognize the specificity of that DNA sequence. So basically what that allows you to do is basically distinguish the binding sites for this regulator versus another regulator by having an information theoretic measure that allows you to say, well, the hypothesis of DNA binding site being here versus background is higher. So I'm going to do a likelihood ratio test and see how much likely is it that this is uh, that the sequence is generated by a motif uh, rather than generated by a random background of that sequence. So the height of these motif logos basically tells you the information content between one bit of information, which is, you know, is it an AG or CT? That's one question, uh, yes, no question, one bit of information, 
or is it an, uh, CT or an AG? Oh, and now that I know which one of the two it is, is it a T or a C? That's two bits of information. So the height of these bars represents the amount of information. And then the content of these bars represents the particular characters that are allowed at that location. And we're going to talk about motifs as entities that cross cut the genome, where, whereas motif instances are entities are, are basically an, a single occurrence of that motif. And again, we're making assumptions here about independence, about the fixed spacing, et cetera. So there's regulatory motifs basically at every level of gene regulation in enhancers, in promoters, in splicing, in RNA. And these motifs are effectively the language of DNA. And that's the language that we're gonna be building these deep learning models uh, in order to recognize. And the reason they're important is because these genetic variants that I mentioned earlier, very often disrupt these regulatory motifs leading to massive disruption of gene regulatory processes and ultimately disease. So there's many technologies for probing gene regulation. You would like to now know where are, for example, all of the enhancers in the genome. If you know that they're marked by histone H3K9 acetylation, then you can basically build antibodies against histone H3K27 acetylation and then pull down all of the chromatin that is associated with that modification. So I can take my chromatinized DNA, I can chop it up randomly, and then build antibodies that either recognize transcription factors that are bound to the DNA, or recognize histone modifications of nucleosomes to bring down the corresponding piece of DNA. And once you've caught that piece of DNA, you can either sequence it directly, or you can sequence it with all kinds of new uh, technologies, or you could hybridize it to a microarray. But basically, once you have the DNA sequence, once you have that piece of DNA, that's uniquely identifiable, and therefore you can find where did it come from in the entire genome. So who's with me here on how this ChIP-seq technology works by building antibodies, and then using these antibodies to pull down different regions of the DNA, associated with either binding of transcription factors or histone modifications, and then sequence and map back to the genome to figure out where did that sequence ultimately come from. Okay, so uh, 70, 25, 5, 0, 5. So, uh, you know, chromatin immunoprecipitation, basically what, the reason why we call it immunoprecipitation is because it's based on the antibody, which is part of the immune system, and then precipitation because you're pulling down DNA. So you can use this technology to now map across the genome all of the locations that have one particular modification. And then you can use that to reveal where are the transcription factors bound. So that's the first technology of chromatin immunoprecipitation. The second technology is DNA accessibility. So basically for the histone modification perturbation uh, modification, we basically have chromatin immunoprecipitation, but you can also simply directly sequence little fragments of DNA based on where a, a, an enzyme that cuts DNA, namely DNAs that digest DNA, where does it make cuts? And based on where it makes cuts, you can detect accessible chromatin. So who's with me on the DNA accessibility? assay where you're just simply chopping up DNA and then looking at where um, is it uh, coming from. Okay, lovely. So 62, 19, 15, 4, 0. Um, and then the third technology that we're going to talk about today is ATAC-seq, which is also catching accessible chromatin, but based on the ability of transposase to bind there. So you basically just throw TN5 transposase in the genome and then wherever it incorporates, it leaves a little mark, and then you can capture all those marks and sequence them, and then that gives you another way of getting at DNA accessibility, okay? So what we're gonna be looking at today is how do we discover the language of DNA using these two technologies, using ChIP-seq and using accessibility. And I see that Anshul Kundaji is here, and I also see that it's 1.30 right now. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to stop there and turn it over to Anshul. Uh, Anshul, are you there? Hey, Marolis, how's it going? Hey, Anshul, thank you so much for uh, giving this uh, guest lecture. Absolutely, happy to. Uh, let me just get my slides up. Your voice is a little soft. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, much better. OK. <clears throat> All right. Uh, just give me one second. Stanford looks beautiful this time of the year. <laughs> yeah, it just it looks exactly like Hawaii, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly <laughs> amazing. No traffic, too. Exactly. And I'm sitting on top of some kind of mountain, right? In, in <laughs> The bay looks so much bluer in your background. It's amazing. All right, so just give me one second. Uh, all right, can you see my screen? Yep, go for it. All right. And by the way, all of you guys have the slides. They're just at the end of the PDF that I posted earlier. So if you, don't, you want to follow along, but I would just recommend focusing on what I'm saying. All right, take yeah, it away. Um, great. So um, thanks for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about how we've used machine learning models to understand how uh, sequence drives uh, uh, some of these, how sequence encodes um, really interesting uh, properties of, of gene regulation, particularly these, uh, these kinds of regulatory elements that we just talked about, uh, that Manolis just talked about today. Um, so this work is really spearheaded by, um, by Ziga Abjak, who was the first author of this paper that, that's based on this work, uh, just came out in Nature Genetics two weeks ago. Um, I'll talk about a bunch of uh, interpretation approaches for deep learning models uh, developed by uh, Avanti in my lab over many years. And this was a really great fun collaboration with Julia's lab, who's a fantastic biologist and really helped us take these models to the next level and discover novel insights. Um, okay, so let's just, just jump right in. <clears throat> As Manos mentioned, there are a whole variety of different experiments you can use to profile regulatory DNA. Uh, here I show you two such examples. Uh, one is these ChIP-seq experiments that are used to obtain genome-wide landscapes of protein DNA interactions. Uh, each of these rows here corresponds to a different uh, protein transcription factor. This encode data, um, and you can see how uh, the same region in the genome is bound kind of in a differential combinatorial manner by different transcription factors. And then you can also obtain a genome-wide map of accessible chromatin using ATAC-seq or DNA-seq. Uh, that kind of gives you a global summary of where any TF binds. It doesn't tell you which TF binds there, but it's one single experiment that sort of summarizes uh, accessible chromatin and binding across the entire genome in a cell state of interest. Um, so what we really want to do is take these data and try to understand why is this, you know, why is this region accessible? Why is this region bound by this transcription factor? How is this happening through sequence, right? And, and, and these transcription factors, as you know, recognize a specific DNA words, often referred to as motifs. And uh, the traditional approach has been to focus on just the individual sort of sequence affinity of each, each protein individually, right? So we kind of reasonably know which proteins bind what kinds of words, what kind of motifs. But uh, the way the regulatory elements have, has, have evolved is they've actually evolved to have much more interesting complex syntax. And by syntax, uh, what I refer to here is rules of composition. So which motifs come with which other motifs inside the same kind of elements to drive specific responses. Uh, rules of arrangement, such as uh, preferred spacing, orientation, and then how, these, uh, how this sort of syntax encoded in the DNA uh, drives cooperative binding of these proteins, right? So um, essentially regulation is more than uh, some of its parts, right? It's not like you have these these entities binding independently and driving signals in additive fashion, they often have super additive effects, super multiplicative effects. So you really want to kind of understand this sort of logic of nonlinearity of how syntax drives uh, cooperative interactions between these proteins binding, uh, binding DNA. Uh, so to do this, we model the problem as a, as a machine learning task. And the way to think about it is given a ChIP-seq or an ATAC-seq DNA's experiment, uh, you get a, a signal across the whole genome, right? With these nice sort of peaks of signal. So uh, one way to convert it into a classic machine learning supervised learning problem is just you take each of the genome and you bin it into little, little chunks of let's say thousand base pairs. And each of these thousand base pairs gets associated with some signal uh, 
uh, from the experiment, right? So it becomes a classical classification or regression task where your inputs are a whole bunch of sequences, millions of sequences through bins across the genome and your output labels are either binary, uh, if you binarize a signal or it could be some continuous value um, summarizing the signal across the entire thousand base pairs. So this has been the traditional approach of sort of summarizing this information at sort of a reasonably low resolution and taking sequences, sequences and mapping them to scalars using various kinds of machine learning models, SVMs, neural networks, you know, random forests, whatever you like. Um, the issue with this approach is that uh, it actually loses a lot of information. And so let me get into some of those details. So now if you take these ChIP-seq data sets or ChIP-exo data sets or DNAs or TAG-seq, and you look at the read uh, coverage profiles at single nucleotide resolution, you see really interesting geometries of the reads. And these actually reflect protein DNA interaction. So you know when the protein binds the DNA at this position, you're sequencing the ends of fragments, right? The chip fragments. What you end up with is these really beautiful mirrored peaks on the two strands, right? You see this nice sort of peak happening on the left side and the right side on the two strands. If you look at chip exo, you get even more high resolution footprints. Same for DNA seq and attack seq, where the protein binds, you see basically a value of signal and you see precise uh, spikes. And you know the precise geometry of these spikes and reads really reflects the combinatorial protein DNA contacts. And so imagine taking this really rich information and just sort of summarizing it into a scalar, right? Just count the number of reads in this region and say 30, right? You suddenly lost all this beautiful structure, uh, structure in, the, in the profiles, which is reflecting the syntax in the sequence. And so what we decided to do is build a new kind of model that, that uh, models the data at its most basic resolution. Uh, think of this like a text to speech converter where the text is the sequence and the speech is, is, the, is the single nucleotide resolution readout from the sequencing experiment, right? A ChIP-seq experiment or a DNA-seq experiment. So we are really not processing the data much. We're just sort of taking the, the, the sequencing reads, we're mapping them to the genome, we're counting how many five prime ends we get at each base pair on the two strands. And then we have a neural network that does this translation, right? Starts with sequence. It's a convolutional neural network. It's purely convolutional. There's no pooling there, there's nothing. It's just a bunch of convolutions that start off from sequence. They start learning sequence features, patterns, right? Like motifs, start combining them into higher order patterns, potentially learning syntax and grammar. And then the higher-most layers start transducing these sequence features into, into real-valued readouts, which are starting to move towards the profile. And the last layer basically does a profile deconvolution, right? Uh, so it's a, it's a straight sequence to profile model, okay? And um, there are two novel things we do here is um, the architecture is not that important often in genomics. Uh, many architectures work equally well. In fact, this is a very simple architecture. It's fully convolutional, which has its advantages. Um, but there are a few little tweaks on the architecture. One is that we use uh, something called dilated convolutions. And dilated convolutions are a way to reduce the parameter space. I don't have too much time to get into this. Uh, hopefully, Marolas can talk about it more either in this lecture or another lecture. Uh, but the basic idea is uh, dilated convolutions like skip positions over which you are, um, you are aggregating information from the lower layers. And so you can get a dramatic exponential increase in the receptive field of the model with fewer layers, okay? So if you, if you, needed, if you needed the final layer, right, this position to see thousand base pairs, you potentially need a very large number of uh, convolutional uh, layers to be able to achieve that receptive field. With dilated convolutions, you get an exponential increase in the receptive field as you go up the layers, and that allows you to, uh, to essentially get very large receptive fields uh, with, uh, with much fewer parameters and much fewer layers. So that, that's what we employ dilated convolutions for. And then we also use residual connections, which are basically connections between layers, which allows information to bypass so for example, information from the first layer in a classic convolutional model would just move to the second layer and the second layer would move into the third layer. With residual connections, you can actually have uh, skip connections so that you can pass information from the lowest layer to, uh, to a higher order layer without having to go through the second layer, right? So it allows you to have more bypasses, which allows you to learn more efficiently, uh, especially with deeper models, okay? So it, the architecture is very simple, nothing complicated. Most of the innovation is in the loss function. Okay, and I want you to really focus on this because typically when you learn deep learning, you will be told certain things like, when you have a binary classification problem, use logistic loss, 
when you have a real value prediction problem, you would use mean squared error loss. That advice is not entirely incorrect, but it is also very basic. The, the most important thing to realize is to design your loss function for the nature of the noise in your data, okay? Now, if you think about what we are modeling here, we are modeling counts. We have read counts falling on these sequences, right? So we have 1,000 base pairs of, 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 of sequence, and we have n number of reads, let's say 400 reads, falling on the 1,000 base pairs, right? So we want our model to be able to predict that the 1,000 base pair sequence has 400 reads mapping to it, but we also want to predict how those 400 reads are precisely distributed across a thousand base pairs, right? So you have two prediction tasks, total number of reads and the distribution of reads at each base pair in, in, the, in the sequence. Uh, what's a good loss function for total number of counts? Like accounts, you could use a Poisson loss, right? You could use a negative binomial loss function, or you could take the log of the total counts and model it using a mean square error. We found that either of those options works very well for, for total counts. Now, if you think about what, what kind of distribution captures an event where you have N entities, right? Let's say 400 entities. Uh, I'm gonna give you the example of balls and bins, right? So let's say you have 400 balls and then I give you a thousand bins and I'm taking these 400 balls and I'm distributing the 400 balls and thousand bins, right? What's a good distribution for that, that kind of event? Any thoughts? Maybe uh, negative binomial. A uh, negative binomial would just model a total number of counts. This is like a balls and bins situation. So I have n bins. There's a probability of observing, you know, balls in each bin, and I have a total number n uh, n of balls that, did, that get distributed across the 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 thousand bins, right? So I want to really model the probability distribution of balls across the bins. What would be a good distribution for that? So how about we think about the multinomial distribution, right? The multinomial distribution, what does it do? It, it's essentially a balls and bin, bin problem, right? You have a probability of observing, you know, uh, balls or reads at each bin. There are a thousand bins in the genome. So there's a there's P1 to P1000, right? That's a probability of observing reads at each position. And then if you have N number of reads, total number of reads that you're that they're inducing into, into that, into those bins then the expected number of reads per position is capital N, where N is the total number of reads, times P, where P is the probability of reads at each position, right? So with a multinomial, you get a beautiful uh, distribution that really captures the nature of how the sequencing data is actually operating in this scenario, right? So our loss function is twofold. We have a mean squared error loss on the log of the total counts. And we have another loss function, which is a multinomial negative log likelihood, which sort of really models the profile distribution of those reads across each of the thousand base pairs. Okay, so we have two loss functions operating hand in hand, one of which models the total number of reads and the other models the precise distribution. And we fit this model using, you know, classical gradient descent with, uh, with backpropagation, okay? Um, so we apply this to, oh, and I forgot to say, you know, if you're given multiple readouts, so let's say you have uh, the same sequence is bound by, you know, uh, you have four or five readouts of different proteins, different ChIP-seq experiments. You can either fit separate models to each of them, or you can fit a multi-task model that has all the models, uh, sorry, all the outputs uh, operating on the same base. So the base model is the same. The final layer diverges across the different tasks and simultaneously predicts four, five, 10 outputs, right? And, and uh, basically the loss function, the way it works is it's just the sum of the loss over all of the tasks, right? So each task is modeled by a combination of these two loss functions. And then the loss over all tasks is the sum of the losses over all of the tasks, okay? We any questions? A, on, any sorry questions to interrupt, on we have a question from the class. Sure. I, think, I think it's a great question, but I, I, we have very little time. So I kind of uh, answered it. So Anshu, why don't you continue and then um, okay, yeah. sounds great. So we applied this uh, this model to uh, to four proteins, very famous proteins. Oh, hello. I'm just giving a talk right now, okay? Hi, Daddy. Hello. My son just came back from school. <laughs> so he might, he, might give, he might give part of the lecture as well. Um, so um, we have, we're looking at four proteins, OC4, SOX2, NANOG, and KLF. These are very famous pluripotency transcription factors that are used to reprogram cells. We looked at these proteins in mouse embryonic stem cells. 
uh, Julia performed uh, these beautiful chip nexus experiments that give very high resolution footprints of these proteins. And we trained the models and we did, uh, we uh, trained them on a subset of chromosomes and we evaluated them on a entire subset of held out chromosomes, okay? And the models are remarkably accurate. You can see right here, these are actually predictions of, of three different enhancers in the genome. This is OCT4, SOX2, NANOG, and KLF. Uh, this is the observed data. This is the predicted data on held out chromosomes never seen before. And so you can really see it's, it's really high resolution and extremely accurate, uh, uh, you know, accurate predictions of where the footprints actually lie. So what happened in NANOG versus uh, on the left, like the, the NANOG on the, yeah. In this scenario? Yeah, in some cases, what happens is that the data is a little bit noisy, like even in this, this case right here. Uh, so you get a lot of missing values and the model sort of imputes. And sometimes the profiles look a little bit different than what, uh, what you see. But overall, if you evaluate the models, you know, I, I intentionally showed these because you know, I can always show you perfect predictions, but obviously the models are not always exactly like the data. Sometimes they denoise the data, sometimes they differ from the data for whatever reason. Uh, it's, not, it's not like, uh, it's, it's not entirely perfect, but it's as close to perfect as it gets because the way we can evaluate this genome wide is uh, we, can, we can really compute the similarity of the predicted profiles, you know, like, sorry, uh, these predicted profiles to the observed profiles using different metrics. So there are two metrics we use. One is the Jensen-Shannon divergence, which sort of captures the distance between any two probability distributions. So you have the observed probability distribution from the actual reads, right? And you have the predicted probability distributions and you can compare them using a Jensen-Shannon distance. Um, what we're showing is the, is the average Jensen-Shannon distance across all the enhancers in the test set, in the test chromosomes, at single base resolution, at two base resolution, five and 10. So uh, what we're doing here is we're smoothing the data a little bit to allow for some amount of, of wiggle room. And for each of those resolutions, we are, we are computing the Jensen-Shannon divergence. The red curve uh, shows the performance of the model with respect to the ground truth. Okay, so that's the actual performance. And just remember the lower the Jensen-Shannon di divergence, the better the model, okay? Um, now we need to compare these values to some ground, uh, to some upper bound and lower bounds, right? So one upper bound we compute is the similarity between replicate experiments. So if we just took one replicate and we use it to predict the other replicate, what would it look like, right? That's the blue curve. And you can see in many cases, the model is essentially as good as replicate concordance. So it's, it's as accurate as replicate experiments would be with respect to each other. Um, the lower bound is essentially if you compare the, uh, the, uh, the profiles, um, uh, the observed profiles to shuffled versions of the observed profiles. That's the that's these gray, uh, these gray curves. So we are substantially better than the baseline, and we are as close to replicates as you can get. Okay, so we are pretty happy with the performance of the model across across the whole genome. So given the model, the prediction is not so important because we already have the data. We really want to understand how the model is able to make these predictions. Okay, uh, so we go into interpretation. We want to take the models and try to dissect what in the sequence is driving these predictions. Uh, so the first approach we take is a feature attribution approach where we can take any enhancer in the genome, uh, you know, use a model to make a prediction. And then through a back propagation approach, we can take the prediction of the model and recursively decompose uh, the contributions of neurons across the layers all the way back down to the nucleotides. Okay, and this is an algorithm called Deep Lift developed by Avanti, which we published in ICML in 2017. <clears throat> so what you essentially end up with is given any enhancer in the genome, any sequence in the genome, we can take the prediction and interpret it, uh, interpret it the context of how each nucleotide in the sequence makes that prediction or contributes to that prediction. And so this is what it looks like. If you take one of these enhancers, this is the OCT4 enhancer that regulates the OCT4 gene. It's the same sequence that's bound by these four different proteins, right? The same sequence is being interpreted differently by the four proteins. And here what I'm showing you is the deep lift score for every nucleotide uh, in the context of each of these outputs, okay? So for different outputs, we're getting different interpretations. You can see some portions of it are common, right? Like this piece of the sequence, this is a, a motif uh, that's commonly used by all four transcription factors, but then you have this one that's specific to NANOG, this one that's specific to KLF4. And if, if you map these to known motifs, you get these really beautiful high resolution interpretations of 
which pieces of the sequence are really driving binding of each of the four transcription factors. So you see a really combinatorial syntax, uh, some of which are commonly used, components are commonly used by all four proteins, other components are used specifically by, by each of the proteins, right? So you can do this for every enhancer in the genome. Now, this is nice if you want to interpret individual units, individual sequences, but can we summarize the patterns learned by the model across the whole genome? So to do that, we, we developed another method called MODISCO. And what MODISCO does is it takes all the thousands of sequences that are bound by a protein of interest. It uses the model to infer DPLF scores for each nucleotide in every sequence, right? So you have thousands of these sequences with these dynamic nucleotide profiles. We then throw away parts of the sequence that are not predictive. And then we cluster these little sequences, these words, based on similarity, and we collapse them, we average them out into non-redundant motifs, okay? So when we do this for these four proteins, we actually end up with a pretty complex um, set of rules or words, uh, motifs that are required to explain binding of the four transcription factors. Canonically, uh, transcription factors typically are defined by one or two motifs. But like I said, in vivo, these proteins don't operate by themselves. They operate in, in collaboration with each other, which means in collaboration with each other, they can generate novel recognition codes, which individually they would not have found, right? And that's why you re actually require about 50 motifs to explain binding of just four proteins, okay? And many of these motifs are actually combinations, like this is a heterodimer, ox ox heterodimer, there's an oct oct homodimer, there are different versions of the nanog motif, there are different versions of the SOX motif, there are different versions of the KLF motif. You also see indirect binding. So this is an example of like the nanog protein that is indirectly recruited by another protein called ZIC3. So ZIC3 recognizes this word, it binds this motif, and then it recruits nanog through a protein-protein interaction. And the way you can tell that is if you look at the footprints, right, the actual signal, the chip nexus signal, you'll see when, when the protein directly binds its motif, like nanog binding its own motif, you see very sharp footprints. When the protein is indirectly recruited, you see kind of fuzzy footprints right here, right? So fuzzy footprints typically are indirect recruitment and direct binding produces very sharp footprints. So I'll just focus on one of these motifs, which is a nanog motif. Nanog we find binds three motifs directly, okay? Three slightly different versions. They all have the core TCA component, but they have different parts of the genome have different like flanks. So some of the nanog motifs actually have this TTAAT flank. Some of them have the GGAAT flank, right? Now what's really interesting is there have been experiments done including crystal structure experiments that really show that the nucleotides with high importance as learned by the neural network are in fact in close proximity in 3D space. Like if you take the crystal structure of which nucleotides in the DNA are in proximity of the actual proteins in DNA binding domain, it's precisely these, these nucleotides. So the amazing thing is the neural network de novo can learn the precise nucleotides which the protein is using to potentially bind, uh, bind DNA, okay? So that's great, we can learn motifs, but what about syntax? I just talked about syntax previously, right? That's what we're really interested in, the higher order arrangements of these motifs in the sequences that drive cooperative binding. Uh, so I'll skip this slide, but here's the first sort of hint to syntax. If we take the nanog motif, this TCA motif I showed you before, and we look in the flanking sequences up to 200 base pairs away, you see this really interesting kind of uh, pattern start popping up this TAT sequences, right? You see these plumes of important nucleotides at periodic distances away from the core nanog motif. And here's another plot showing you uh, on the X, sorry, this axis shows thousands of locations that are bound by the nanog motif, uh, bound by the nanog protein. Uh, they have this TCA site right at the, at the center. And the heat map is showing the important scores of nucleotides flanking that cent central TCA uh, core site. You see these beautiful periodic patterns, right? The amazing thing is that the periodicity of these patterns is exactly 10 and a half base pairs, which is a helical turn of DNA. So what this is telling us is that nanog binds DNA in a way that there's something else happening precisely at 10 and a half base pair uh, 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 see, uh, uh, distances away from the nanog motif, which happens to be on the same side of the DNA helix, right? And what's really cool is there is evidence from other experiments that proteins like nanog, which belong to the homeobox family of proteins, they tend to bind DNA as homodimers. So they form pairs with each other and they bind the same side of DNA 
even sometimes on nucleosomes, okay, on top of these nucleosomes. That's why you're starting to see these 10 and a half base pair periodic patterns that the neural network is able to pick up. Uh, so the other thing we do is we take the nanog motifs and we actually look at the distance between core nanog sites uh, as identified by the neural network in the genome. And you again see that if you plot as a function of distance, the frequency of nanog, nanog homodimers, you see again this really beautiful 10 and a half base pair periodicity kick in, right? And it's irrespective of strand. So this, this TCA can be on the positive positive strand or the positive negative strand. It doesn't matter. You still see this really beautiful uh, helical uh, periodicity kicking in. So there's a, there's a soft syntax of a preferred spacing of multiples of 10 and a half base pairs, which is the helical turn of DNA. And what's really interesting is if you align these, these sequences precisely by their, uh, by their motifs, which are separated by these 10 and a half base pair frequencies, and you plot the actual raw data, the chip nexus data, you actually see these spikes in the chip nexus data every 10 and a half base pairs. That's how the model is able to learn this syntax, because what it sees is across the genome, it sees these subtle spikes in signal, and every time it sees the spikes in signal, it co-localizes with these TCA sites, and that's how it's able to learn the syntax driving uh, binding, okay? We see this with, for Nanog with other, other motifs as well, similar 10 and a half base pair preferred spacing constraints. And now we want to really show how this syntax results in cooperative binding. So to do that, we actually uh, rely on uh, using the model like an oracle. Like, can we do interesting perturbation experiments in silico that allow us to gain insights on how syntax drives binding of these different proteins? So we do two kinds of experiments, one of which is a synthetic experiment where we create some synthetic DNA, okay, just some random DNA sequence. We embed two motifs, one motif at this position, one motif at, th at this position, and then we change the spacing between these motifs. And we predict, we use a model to predict binding of protein A and protein B. Okay, so it's like a synthetic experiment that you're doing uh, in, 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 in the, um, using the model. The other kind of experiment is like a in silico CRISPR experiment where you take actual enhancers in the genome. The model has annotated a bunch of these motifs and then we systematically mutate motifs and we again use a model to predict effects of binding of the four proteins, okay? So I'll start off with the first uh, simulation experiment. This is a synthetic experiment. <clears throat> uh, we've created a sequence, a random sequence, which does not, the proteins don't bind to this random sequence. We embed the nanog motif at this position and the oxox motif at this position, okay? And we start moving the oxox motif towards the nanog motif. And the model is predicting, as we make this change in distance, the predicted binding for nanog and the predicted binding for oc4. Okay, and so as a function of distance between these two motifs, we can we can plot the response of nanog and the response of oc4 to this syntax, right? And you see something amazing pop up. So the red curve is showing the response of oc4 to the spacing between the oxox motif and the nanog motif. Okay, irrespective of the distance, you see no response. Basically, oc4 doesn't care about where the nanog motif sits. And this is very interesting because OC4 is a classic pioneer transcription factor. It is known to be one of these transcription factors that can just bind DNA and do its thing. It doesn't care about who else is around it. Nanog, on the other hand, responds really violently. You can see exponential rise in the binding of Nanog as the OXOX motif moves towards it. And it's not only exponential rise, but as you get closer, you see this really beautiful periodicity kick in, right? Which is the same 10 and a half base pairs. So what you're seeing is a soft syntax preference that as the oxox and nanog motif are, uh, as you move them towards each other, you see a massive cooperative influence of oc4 on nanog, and that increases all the way up to 150 base pairs away, right? So you have a kind of a reasonably distant cooperative effect. And you see a preferred spacing that if you're at precisely 10 and a half base pair or multiples of 10 and a half base pair, you see these really nice cooperative Spikes. Can you give us any insights as to what layer of your uh, network is actually learning these relationships? Is it like one layer up, two layers up, three layers up? Like how high level is this information? That's an excellent question. So actually we have this in the paper, in the supplement, we did an experiment where we started removing dilated convolutions, okay? And what's amazing is as you remove the dilated convolutions, the syntax starts disappearing, 
the model has a harder and harder time. And if you remove three or four dilations, it disappears completely. Perfect. Okay. So it's very important for the model to be able to learn these higher layers because the higher layers are really learning the syntax, not the lower layers. Great. Okay. Thank you. We're kind of out of time, so I don't know if uh, you can. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I just have two more slides. That's it. Okay, um, so uh, this was the sort of the synthetic experiment. We can replicate the same experiment in the genome in the real enhancer. So here's an enhancer that's bound by OX4 and NANOG. You again see the two motifs. We can delete the OXOX motif, and the model predicts OX4 dies, NANOG dies. We can delete the NANOG motif, and nothing happens to OX4, and NANOG gets attenuated, right? So you can again see this asymmetric effect of OC, NANOG having no effect on OC4, but OC4 having this really strong effect on NANOG with this 10 and a half base pair periodicity. And we learn many such really interesting syntaxes between different combinations of, of words. And lastly, we validated this with, with actual CRISPR experiments in the genome. I won't spend too much time on this, but I'll just give you one nice like uh, vignette. Um, here's one enhancer, which is bound by NANOG and SOX2. Uh, here's a SOX2 motif, and then this is what the model predicts as to SOX2's binding profile. We perform the experiment, it looks really similar. Then we mutate these two nucleotides, and the model predicts, oh, there's attenuation of binding at this position and attenuation of signal pretty far away. And if we make the, if we actually do the experiment, you see the same effect. You see attenuation and attenuation. Then we can re reverse this. We can do uh, the same mutation, but this time we are measuring NANOG. We're predicting NANOG or we're measuring NANOG. And you can again see the model's predictions alongside the experiment are really beautifully on track with each other. Um, and we can reverse this and we can mutate the NANOG motif and look at the effects. The model again predicts almost exactly what you see in the experiment. And we can look at, mutate the NANOG motif and look at the effect on SOX2 binding. And you can see no effect as we predicted, right? NANOG has no effect on SOX2. SOX2 has a massive effect on NANOG. So I'll just stop there and uh, just mention that I introduced to you BPNet, a new kind of model that can, like a text-to-speech converter for genomic data. We can do this for uh, any kind of assay, ChIP-seq, EXO, cut and run, DNAs, attack, histone, rampage, whatever you want. Uh, we have interpretation frameworks that take these black box models, open them up, and ribbons come out of it, telling us bio biological stories about how syntax affects TF cooperativity. And I showed you that the models can make predictions that can be validated through really amazing uh, uh, high-resolution CRISPR experiments. Okay, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, I want everybody to give uh, Anshul a big hand. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. And uh, you know, some students might be reaching out for their projects if you're interested in uh, mentoring any of the regulatory. Actually, I just want to tell you one really quick vignette. Avanti, who I showed you in my lab, is somebody I met while I was a postdoc in Manolis's lab. She was a fantastic undergrad super Europe student who ended up being a PhD student in my lab. And she's worked with me for the past six years. She's absolutely amazing. I'm sure all of you are. And so interesting combinations happen through courses and and PhD advisors and postdoc advisors. So I hope to see you in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Anshu. All right. Uh, so we are also very fortunate to have Avantika from NVIDIA with us today. So Avantika, if you want to uh, share your screen and give us the uh, second uh, mini guest lecture. So thanks so much, Anshu. Bye, see you soon. Bye. All right, uh, thanks for inviting me, Manolis. Let me share my screen over here. Do you all see this? Yep. All right. So hi, everyone. My name is Avantika. I work as a senior scientist on the genomics research team at NVIDIA. Uh, what does that mean? So at NVIDIA, we have a genomics team, which is a group of really amazing scientists and engineers. And we are developing software to solve a lot of different, very difficult problems in genomics. We collaborate with a lot of academic labs, as well as with other companies around the world. And uh, the tools that we develop use machine learning, deep learning, and accelerated computing, all built on NVIDIA's hardware. And we aim to build a uh, software that's faster and more accurate than uh, the current state of the art for many different problems, so that we can enable new biological discoveries. And we work across a lot of different uh, areas in genomics, including but not limited to single cell genomics, cancer genomics, long read sequencing, and many others. So I'm here to tell you about a recent paper of ours, which came out, in fact, this Monday in Nature Communications. 
And this is a collaboration between our team and our friends at the Bowen Rostro Lab in Harvard. So this is called Deep Learning Based Enhancement of Epigenomic Data with AttackWorks. And AttackWorks, as the name suggests, is a model that works with AttackSeq data that you all heard about. And AttackSeq measures chromatin accessibility. The idea is that we sequence DNA and we get these short reads or short fragments of DNA sequence that we can then align to the genome. And when we align them, we get a coverage track that looks something like this where you can plot every position in the genome on the x-axis and on the y-axis, you can plot the number of reads that align to that position. So you get this track where you can see distinct peaks and those peaks represent accessible chromatin, which often corresponds to the active regulatory regions of the genome. So a taxi can help us identify the active regulatory elements in different types of cells or tissues, and that can help us to understand how the genome is regulated and how uh, variants or sequence variants or mutations in non-coding regions of the genome can affect our biology. And ataxy can also be performed at the single cell uh, level, which gives us a higher resolution into biology. So biological tissues have mixtures of many different kinds of cells which perform different functions. And over here, you can see what happens when we do ataxy at the level of individual cells. So if you see uh, on here on the y-axis in every row, you're plotting the signal in a different cell. And you can see that uh, within a sample, you can have many different types of cells and there's some variation in the chromatin accessibility across these cells. Uh, if you add up the signal coming from all of the different cells, you can get a high quality signal that looks like this shown here where you can identify distinct peaks. But what you can also see from this picture is that if you look at individual cells, you often uh, don't have the level of resolution required to get this clear signal and identify peaks from corresponding to accessible chromatin. And that's because uh, typically you just don't have enough sequencing reads that come from every individual cell. So when we analyze a single cell attack seek experiment, uh, we do something like what's shown here on the right. So here I am uh, looking at chromatin accessibility in uh, single cells from sequence from human blood. And here, every dot in this plot represents an individual cell. And we have clustered the cells based on their chromatin accessibility so that cells with similar accessibility profiles come together into the same cluster. And at a high level, these clusters correspond to different types of cells in our sample, which are performing different functions. And we can then take an individual cluster and add up uh, the signal from all of the individual cells and get an aggregate chromatin accessibility profile like this. And we can do this for every cluster. And then if we want, we can compare them and ask, how is this type of cell different from that type of cell? Or why does a particular sequence variant in our genome influence the function of this type of cell, but not of that type of cell? But in doing so, we lose all of the variation uh, within each population of cells. So that brings me to the topic of uh, data quality. So, Although ATAC-seq is much simpler than many methods that came before it, there are still reasons why you might uh, do an ATAC-seq experiment and not get uh, the high quality results that you need. So for example, one issue is sequencing depth. So here's an ATAC-seq experiment that was sequenced to a depth of 50 million reads in total. And then here is a look at uh, the same ATAC-seq experiment, but this time we took only 1 million reads. So clearly if you don't have uh, if you have too few sequencing reads, your data is noisy, it's sparse, you can't get a clear, you can't accurately locate the peaks or the accessible chromatin regions. Uh, sample preparation, so your sample quality, uh, the number of cells in your sample, the way you store it and prepare it, that also matters. And then another issue, uh, which is perhaps the most important here, is the number of cells in, a sing in the single cell attack seek experiment. So if, if, I'm, uh, lo if I'm looking at a particular type of cell, which is very abundant in my sample, I can combine the signal across lots of cells and get a clear signal, which allows me to tell uh, where the peaks are in this particular cell type. But if I'm looking at a less abundant type of cell, I might have very few cells and that gives me very few reads. And so I can't uh, get a clear signal of what's going on in this cell type. And 
even within abundant cell types, there might be further heterogeneity within this population. There might be sub subpopulations of cells within the cell type. So I need, uh, so there's a limit to the resolution at which I can study this experiment. So AttackWorks is a deep learning model that we developed to address these problems. Uh, AttackWorks takes as input the coverage track from an any attack seek experiment, which could be a noisy experiment coming from any of these different sources. And the aim of AttackWorks is to improve the quality of the attack seek signal and also to identify the locations of the peaks or the accessible chromatin sites. So AttackWorks produces, it takes in as input the coverage track and produces two outputs. One is a denoised or enhanced coverage track. And the second is the locations of the peaks in this coverage track. Uh, AttackWorks uses a ResNet or residual neural network architecture. This is a fully convolutional model composed of multiple convolutional layers. Uh, it's based on models that were originally developed for computer vision. The difference is that uh, here we use one dimensional convolutional layers instead of the two dimensional layers that are typically used to analyze image data. Because here our input is one dimensional. Basically for every position in the genome, we have a number which corresponds to the number of reads mapping to that position. Uh, so Anshul uh, explained a lot of the things that I was going to explain here. Our model also uses dilated convolutions and that, is, that improves our results a lot. Uh, we use residual connections. So basically we have connections that skip across multiple convolutional layers and pass information from shallower to deeper layers within the model. Mm. And we have a multi-part loss function. So because our model produces two outputs, our loss function is a weighted combination of a regression loss function, which measures how accurate our uh, denoised coverage track is, and a classification loss function, which, measure, which measures how accurately we can classify the locations of the peaks. So for the classification loss, basically we are classifying every position in the genome as this position belongs to a peak or this position doesn't belong to a peak. And unlike the models that Anshul was talking about earlier, AttackWorks doesn't use the genome sequence as input. It only takes the coverage at every position in the genome. So can anyone suggest why we do that? Why we do that? Okay, so the reason is that um, we, build, we want this model to be transferable across different types of cells. So we want to, for example, train a model on one type of cell and then be able to apply it to a completely different type of cell. And if we were to feed it the DNA sequence, and we have seen this to some extent, uh, the model would learn particular sequence motifs as Anshul showed you. It would learn motifs that are associated with high chromatin accessibility but those motifs can actually differ from cell type to cell type. The motifs that predict accessibility in one type of cell don't necessarily predict activity in a different type of cell. So that is just a choice that we made in order to allow our model to be more generalizable. And then how does the model actually learn to do this? So we developed a very, very simple training strategy. So first we started by training our model to enhance low coverage attack seek data. So here we take, uh, we take any attack seek data set, which, has, uh, which is sequenced to a high coverage. So we have data sets that were sequenced to 50 million reads in total. And then we randomly subsample a subset of these reads. So we would randomly choose say 1 million of the 50 million reads. And those 1 million reads would give us a noisy low coverage data set. And then we can feed this pair of clean and noisy data sets to our model. And the model learns how to take the noisy data set as input and predict the high coverage track as output, as well as the locations of the peaks. And then if I feed it low coverage noisy data sets from different sources, it can use the weights that it learned and predict what this data would have looked like if it was sequenced to a higher depth. So this was a way of, in which we could generate as much training data as we wanted very easily. So here's a very high level uh, example of the results that we got. So here we trained a model uh, using data from 
uh, four different human cell types. And then we applied it to a different human cell type, which was not included in its training data set. And here, this is just uh, what the results look like. So here's an example of a clean data set, which was sequenced to 50 million reads. And you can see a bit of, a, of the track here. And then this is the same data set if we randomly subsample 1 million reads from it. So you can see that it is much noisier and we lose the ability to identify many of these peaks. But then we can take this 1 million read signal and pass it through ATTACKWORKS. And this is the output that is predicted by ATTACKWORKS. So you can see that ATTACKWORKS is able to remove the background noise from the signal track and enhance the many of the peaks that were previously hard to identify. Here is a close up view of one peak. So in black, you can see that there was a, a peak in, this, in the original signal close to this gene. The peak is shown here in red below the signal. And then when we downsampled to 1 million reads, uh, the peak becomes less clear, it becomes harder to distinguish from nearby noise. And if we look at MAX2, which is a standard peak calling software, MAX2 is not able to identify this peak. But after passing this uh, low coverage signal through ATTACKWORKS, ATTACKWORKS is able to distinguish between the peak and the nearby noisy signal. And it's also able to classify most of this peak and tell you that it's an accessible region. Here's another example. And here uh, we've gone to an even lower subsampling depth. So we are subsampling now 200,000 reads out of 50 million. And here I'm showing you the four cell types that were used to train the model, as well as the fifth cell type that it was tested on. So here you can see that there's a peak in the test data, which was not present in any of the cell types that was used to, were used to train the model. And ATTACKWORKS is again able to denoise the peak. It's able to distinguish between the peak and nearby random noise. And it's able to pretty accurately identify where the, where the peak, where the accessible chromatin is located. And also, if we look at peaks that were present in the training data, ATTACKWORKS does not uh, identify those peaks in the test data because they're not present in this test cell type. So it's able to generalize. Uh, between cell types, it's able to take in new data, which is different from what it saw in training. So these are uh, performance metrics across the entire genome. So how do we measure performance here? So first we take the clean data set, which had 50 million sequencing reads, and then we downsample it to different sequencing depths, like 0.2 million, 1 million, and so on. And here in blue, we are plotting the Pearson correlation between the signal track between this downsample signal track and the original 50 million read signal track. So you can see that you lose a lot of quality as you go down to lower to subsampling. But after passing this, uh, these tracks through ATTACKWORKS, uh, this is the improved Pearson correlation shown here in green. So you can see that at every sequencing depth, ATTACKWORKS makes the signal track more accurate. And here in dashes, we are so the solid lines are performance across the whole genome the dashed line are performance on chromosome 10. And we include chromosome 10 because in all of our training data, we never trained the model on chromosome 10. So again, the model is able to generalize to new cell types as well as to new genomic regions. And here we are measuring the performance of the model at classifying uh, the locations of peaks. So here we are looking at the area under the precision recall curve. And for every low coverage data set, we are seeing how well the model was able to classify positions along the genome as, as to whether they belong to a peak or not. And again, at every sequencing depth, we see that the model is able to identify peaks uh, much better than the previous method of MAX2. What this data also tells you is that if you look at a particular sequencing depth, say 5 million reads, 10 million, or 20 million reads, ATTACKWORKS is able to produce the same, uh, the same quality results for less sequencing. So effectively, using deep learning, we can reduce the cost of doing our experiment while producing the same results. Here's another experiment where instead of using low coverage attack seek, we used uh, low, just a low quality attack seek. So here we took two, uh, two attack seek experiments, both of which were performed in human erythroblasts, and both of which were sequenced to the same depth. But uh, for just because of sample related issues, one, one of these samples ended up having a much lower signal to noise ratio than the other. 
And again, by training an attack works model to deal with data sets like this, we were able to pass this low quality signal through an attack works model. And it was able to clean up the background noise and identify peaks that matched very closely with the high quality signal. We can also quantify this by looking at the enrichment of uh, coverage around transcription start sites or the locations where the transcription of a gene begins. And we see that in the low quality signal, we see some, we see that transcription start sites have somewhat higher coverage than the rest of 10 uh, regions that are located far away from them. But after passing the signal through ATTACKWORKS, ATTACKWORKS improves this enrichment. So now we see that uh, the regions located close to transcription start sites have an even higher signal compared to distant regions, which is what we expect from an attack seek experiment. Finally, uh, kind of the most interesting use case of this model for us is when we come to the issue of single cell attack seek data. So I mentioned that in single cell attack seek data, we are limited in our ability to study small populations of cells. And we can train a model to address this exact problem. And how we do that is very similar to how we train the model on low coverage data. We can take a single cell attack seek experiment and we can take a very abundant cell type for which we have lots of cells. We can add up the signal from all of the cells to get a clean signal like what's shown here with high quality peak calls. And then just like we randomly selected a subset of reads, we can randomly select a subset of cells from this population and use those to get a noisy signal. And then we can train an attack works model to take the signal from few cells and denoise it to predict what the signal from many cells would look like. And once we have this trained model, we can apply it to small populations of very few cells, either from the same experiment or even from different single cell experiments. And it can predict uh, what the data would have looked like if we had had more cells to sequence. So how did this work? So we did an experiment here where we took a single cell sequencing of different types of human blood cells. And we trained a model using two types of cells and applied it to a third type of cell, which is the NK or natural killer cells. And here I'm plotting once again, the AUPRC of peak calling for this model. And on the X axis, we have different numbers of cells. So we applied this, uh, these trained models to one cell at a time, five cells at a time, 10 cells or 50 cells. And these correspond also to very low numbers of reads. And in blue, you see the performance of MAX2, which is the existing non-deep learning based method. And we see in green, the performance of ATTACKWORKS. So ATTACKWORKS was much better at classifying peaks in very small numbers of cells. But also in gray, we show the number of cells that MAX2 requires to match the performance of ATTACKWORKS. So for example, from five cells, ATTACKWORKS was able to produce results as good as MAX2 produced with 100 cells. And with 50 cells, ATTACKWORKS can produce results as good as you would currently get from 400 cells. So, in general, attack works can obtain the same quality results from 10 times fewer cells at a time. So this increases the resolution at which we can study single cell chromatin accessibility. And we, in our paper, we test these models across many different data sets. So we show that the models are actually transferable across experiments, across cell types, and across species. So you can take a model that you train on one cell type from one single cell experiment and apply it to a different experiment, which was done on a totally different sample from a totally different species. So any questions at this point? And then I can go on to give you an example of how this was used. Do you have any uh, <clears throat> insights as to how close do these training sets have to be <laughs> to the ultimate product? Basically, have you tried sort of training on very different type of cells? Is it just a general property of attack that you're learning? Or is there a cell type specificity to these properties? I haven't seen any cell type specificity, but what we have seen is that performance depends on matching the sequencing protocol. So there are different experimental protocols that you can use for single cell attack seek. Yeah. For example, you can isolate the cells into droplets or there are different, there are different ways of separating the signal from different cells. So the models are not perfectly transferable across uh, those kinds of experimental differences. 
All right, so here is an example of uh, how we applied attack work. So this experiment was done by Zachary Chiang, who's a grad student at the Bowen Rostro lab. And they looked at uh, human hematopoietic stem cells. And these are stem cells that differentiate into various types of cells in our blood, including uh, immune cells, B cells, T cells, as well as the cells that give rise to our red blood cells. And um, broadly, these hematopoietic stem cells can differentiate into one of two lineages, which is the uh, lymphoid lineage of cells or the erythroid lineage of cells. The lymphoid lineage gives rise to, for example, T cells, B cells, and others, and the erythroid uh, lineage gives rise to different kinds of cells, including eventually our red blood cells. So they did a single cell sequencing experiment where they profiled about 10,000 hematopoietic stem cells. And here is what these cells looked like. And they saw that there is uh, heterogeneity across this single cell population. So here we are looking at the accessibility of a sequence motif that is associated with the GATA2 transcription factor, which is involved in uh, differentiation of blood cells. And you can see that there is a gradient across this population. So there is some variation across this population of uh, hematopoietic stem cells. It's not a homogeneous population. And uh, there has been work in the past hypothesizing that there are subgroups within, this, within these hematopoietic stem cells that are primed or settled to differentiate into one of these two lineages. But uh, there ha we haven't been very well able to study those subpopulations because they are quite rare and not possible to isolate as of now. So you can read more about how exactly the selection was done in our paper, but Zach selected three subpopulations of 50 cells each from this 10,000 cell experiment, uh, which we hypothesized to correspond to lymphoid prime cells, erythroid prime cells, and long-term renewing hematopoietic stem cells. And we wanted to ask what makes these lymphoid prime cells and erythroid prime cells different? What has fixed them to differentiate into one of the two lineages? And because these, these populations included only 50 cells, we couldn't get clean results using existing peak calling methods. But using attack works, we were able to denoise the signal coming from uh, each of these two populations. And you see over here, the attack seek, the denoised attack seek signal around various important hematopoietic genes. And you can see that there are clear differences between the signal from the lymphoid prime stem cells and the erythroid prime stem cells. And we could identify specific regulatory elements that were active only in one of these two lineages. So we could, we can now look at these regulatory elements and look at what controls this process of lineage priming. So these are, I want to acknowledge all of the people who were involved in this project. So there were a lot of different people who worked on this model at NVIDIA, as well as uh, Raj, a very talented intern whom we had from MIT, and all of our collaborators at the Boone Rostro Lab. And uh, please reach out if any of you have more questions about our work. And we have internships available on our team at NVIDIA. So if you're excited about deep learning and genomics, please reach out. Thank you. I think we finished just on time. Oh, <clears throat> very cool. Can you guys hear me? Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you so much, Avantika. I'm pretty sure that we're going to have more people from your team <laughs> come back. And uh, one more thing, if you would be happy to not only have students maybe come for internships, but also have, uh, you know, students collaborate with you guys during their projects. Uh, you're muted. Absolutely. I'd be happy to hear from any of the students here. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Avanti. Uh, can I ask the class to stick around for just one minute, one more minute? So um, <clears throat> I'm going to do a quick poll. So first of all, who uh, found, oh gosh, uh, Jackie, could you uh, share the poll for, I'm afraid that I disconnected myself. <laughs> Actually, hold on, we're going to stop the recording here. <laughs>